Hi, this is the second lesson in our series about research in our course on communication, research, and analysis for scientists and engineers. Now that you know how you are going to collect and organize the information you need for your research, you're ready to start doing the hard work of actually finding that information. We'll talk more about a staged approach to doing this in the lesson on research process, but for now, we're just going to focus on the different kinds of information that could help you. Before you decide that you already know how to get access to the literature and what you will find there, there are probably a lot more sources than you think. Research is not only done by staff at universities and government labs where part of their job is to publish. It's also done by scientists and engineers at companies with a commercial interest in not always telling everyone what they're doing. There's still information out there, however, and we'll try to give you clues on how to find it in this video. Remember, though, this is only an introduction. When you're done with this video, you should go and read chapters 2 and 3 of Explaining the Future. The exercises that follow in the lesson will also help you to find out what kinds of information are likely to be relevant to you and to find what you need efficiently. But let's start in the two places that you're most used to looking for information, in the library and on the free web. And by free, I mean literally not restricted by a paywall or by a corporate barrier. You can think of several different types of entity that generate information that you will need. Researchers and groups are likely the most important, but the activities of companies and technical societies and trends or practices in industries and disciplines may also be useful to follow. From the library, you'll get books and ebooks, conference and journal papers. There is more there too, but these are what the library is best for. The free web has a lot of good stuff too. Almost every organization or research group will have some kind of site, and you can retrieve a lot of information from these. For newspapers and magazines, you should be well covered. Between the library and the web, you should be able to get access to most publications for free. However, there's a lot of other material out there that you may have to ask for. And then it might be free, have strings attached, or even require some kind of payment. The real point here is that there are probably information sources that you would not have thought of looking for, particularly those written in bold, so we'll discuss some of these briefly. Of all sources, however, the most important will likely be technical papers. Of course you know about these, but one of your most important skills as a researcher will be to triage these efficiently so you are not wasting your time with irrelevant material, and then to use them to find more information. Here's one approach. First, look at the title, and if that's of interest, read the abstract. You should be able to get the gist of whether the paper is in any way relevant from there. If it's not, there's no point troubling yourself to download it. Before you put it in your reference database, however, have a quick read of the conclusion and any discussion above. It could be that the paper is on the right subject, but on an aspect of it that you don't care about. You can throw the paper out at this point if that's true. Finally, skim the introduction. This should be really helpful since, if it's in any way well written, it should give you the context of the work being described. Here you should get what the researchers are trying to achieve, whose work they have built on, their competition, and so forth. You'll learn to do this yourself in the technical argument lesson. Now, if you still think it's genuinely relevant, you can put it in your to read folder. The most helpful kind of paper you can find is a review. Essentially, this is almost like a mini textbook on the subject at hand. If you are able to find a recent one in your field by a reliable group, you are extremely lucky. Read it carefully and it will save you a huge amount of time and energy. When you've read a paper and have understood why it's useful to you, you should immediately go read the bibliography, which should be able to point you to more useful papers. Better still, highlight interesting citations as you're reading. If it's a review paper, looking through the bibliography should help to give you a really good map of the field, showing which research groups are important and why. For instance, 
Thanks to Harvard referencing, which we'll discuss in the Referencing and Plagiarism lesson, you can see at a glance that Brunner and Domine have important groups in this particular technical area. You've probably used bibliographies a lot before, but you may not have used forward referencing. This is where you look up a key book or paper in your field and then find out who has claimed to have built on that work or tried to refute it by citing it later. This can help you to find related work you might not have found otherwise, and also determine whether a paper was later superseded or discredited. I've shown you here how to do this with Google Scholar, but you can also do it with other databases, including Web of Science. Now, let's move on to the other kinds of information that are out there and how they might help you, starting with newspapers and magazines. It's true, they're not primary sources, but they can be helpful in lots of ways. Specifically, they can help you acclimatize to a new application area, understand a new technology that you'll need to use in your experiments, or give you an idea of advancements in your field or associative fields that you may have missed. If you know what you're looking for, you can find it directly on the web or in the library. However, you might also be interested in a tool that we developed here at UCL that allows you to find these kinds of articles in a way that is customizable to your interests. We'll give you a chance to explore this in the lesson. Now, if you're working in applied science or engineering, you may have companies or industries that you want to follow. If you can't find anything in the normal technical literature, there is other good information out there, but you need to know where to look. One source is white papers. These are technical papers written by companies to explain what they're doing and why they think it's important. Here are a couple from Intel. The one on the left is more like a set of technical specifications, while the other is more like a full technical paper. You can also find interesting technical stuff in company blog posts and web pages. Just remember, this material will not have been peer reviewed. It's just what the company wants you to know. Patents are a really great source of information because they have to be filed whether companies want to advertise what they're doing or not. These documents are designed to be really difficult to read, but they can give you clues to what a company is doing. If you need more information, one thing you can do is look up the patent authors to see if they've published anything in the open literature. To find patents, Google is one source of information and another is a SPASnet run by the European Patent Office. Staying with industry for a moment, let's move on to higher level, more strategic information. If you want to know what a specific company is doing, one option is to look at their annual report. For large corporations, this information is usually freely available for investors or potential investors, which could be anybody. As you'll see in these pages from a recent IBM annual report, these documents contain a mixture of glossy public relations material, status reports, plans for the future, and statutory financial information. Industry analysts can read between the lines of such documents to see which way a company is moving. To see how a whole industry is evolving, you might look for industry roadmaps. Like white papers, these vary widely in scope. This report on antimicrobial resistance is just a few pages, while the semiconductor roadmap has hundreds across several volumes. While both of these are international, this report is a summary of plans for a specific industry in a specific country, cybersecurity in Australia. If you want to know about the size and growth of industries into the future, you can find lots of references online to consultants' reports. The full text is usually prohibitively expensive, but if you're lucky, you can find useful quotes in technical websites and magazines. If you're looking for trends within an academic discipline as well as industry, technical societies and the sub-societies that make them up can be good sources of information. These organizations cover every discipline, from the highly theoretical to the entirely applied. They run conferences and other events, publish journals and books, and often certify professionals. Another thing you can do is look for conferences. 
Even if you can't attend, the program can give you an idea of what is considered an important trend. For instance, the fact that there are two separate sessions related to reservoir computing suggests that this is an important emerging area. Even without seeing the papers themselves, that's a helpful hint. Moving back to more technical material, there are lots of things that you can get directly from companies or researchers. Obviously, you can speak to people, arrange for lab visits, even organize collaborations. Making the right contacts is a good use of your time at conferences, whether virtually or in person. If you can connect with people, there is lots of stuff they may be willing to share. At the most basic level, they may be able to send you preprints of papers or tell you a little about work that hasn't been published yet, including giving you copies of PhD theses, which are not always easily available online. They may also be willing to share data so that you can do verification experiments, compare your results with theirs, or work on a common problem. For instance, this is an example from the MNIST dataset used freely by many to test how good machines are at classifying numbers. Contacts may also be able to share open source code for tools they've built. It's a win for them because someone else is using their tool, and it's a win for you because you don't have to build it yourself. There are all kinds of people you can talk to and all kinds of help they can give. They may be potential clients or collaborators, competitors or consultants. Ask questions and listen to the answers, but be cautious. Don't forget, everybody lies. They may have only partial information. They may have an interest in steering you away from or towards a particular approach. They may not know the limits of their own expertise. We'll discuss this in detail in Chapter 3 of the book. The main thing is that there is a huge amount of good information out there. Listen to what people say, but then verify it for yourself. That's it for this lesson on information sources. Make sure to go and read chapters 2 and 3 of Explaining the Future Next. You should be able to get it from the library, but if you prefer your own copy, you can get a discount using the promotion code shown. Also, make sure to go through the lesson activities so that you can practice finding exactly the information you need.